Good evening and thanks for tuning in tonight. My name is Tanisha Shades Spain and I'm your host for Mid American Gardener. Thanks for joining us and we are live tonight so we're going to want to take your calls. We've got lots of show and tells and of course what you all tune in for our amazing expert panelists to share all their knowledge with you. So let's jump in, have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty. So Ella, we'll start with you. Um, I'm Ella Maxwell. I work at a garden center up in Peoria Hair Nursery and I'm also a master gardener and my specialty is um, pretty much anything in the garden center. So um, uh, shrubs, trees and um, perennials. Wonderful. Phil? I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist at the University of Illinois and I'll be glad to answer your bug questions. The bug guy. Last but not least. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Marty Alanya, and I'm a retired uh, landscaper, um, but I still got a head full of stuff I'm happy to share with you. Um, perennial shrubs, you know, pick something. Heck, we'll just give it a shot. We'll just give it a How shot. How hard can it be? We come up with. You know, the gang is all here, there you right? Go. The band is back together. We brought stuff. We yeah. have stuff. Yeah, we got that's stuff. right. And we if do. you want to have them answer your question, give us a call, 333-3495. So first round is always show and tells. And Ellen, we'll start with you. What'd you bring us? Well, I brought some elephant ears. Uh, Liz from Facebook Messenger had talked about how to store these. Now, what I did is I um, cut off the tops, and you want to do that now because the temperatures have really been dropping, and these are a tender bulb. If you don't lift them and store them, they will die outside. So you can see that this one here just has uh, dirt on it. This one here was washed. This came from a friend of mine. She took the extra step. I, I don't really wash them. I will store them either in a paper sack um, or in a cardboard box, a single layer in a cool, um, like a closet, or actually they're in my basement. And that's all you have to do. And then uh, once danger of frost is gone, they can be planted outside. But um, if you want, you can get a head start by potting them up in March, but you'd have to grow them inside. So what about leaving or what about bringing them in in the fall? Do you see a lot of people doing that? Well, that's what we're talking about. No, I mean like letting them live. Oh, like as a house plant. the plant. whole thing inside. Yes, yeah. you certainly can do that. Some of these are really quite striking. There's colcasia and alocasia. Mm -hmm. Both of those are considered an elephant ear. And um, mm -hmm. uh, some people do grow them as a house plant, but I have quite a few of them and they're actually grown in the ground. Um, I've got a couple in containers and maybe I'll try that. Yeah, okay, all right, thank you so I, much. I had a client who brought them in every year. We'd set them out after danger of frost mm -hmm. and they did fabulously and then we'd take them back in, take them back in Sunny in the spot, I'm sure, because uh, she, well, she had large, large, large north-facing windows. So they were like floor oh. to ceiling. So that was enough light. Remember, that's a tropical plant, and mm -hmm. it probably grows beneath the canopy mm -hmm. of some other things. Okay. So they did very well. They did very well. So if you've got some, you can bring them in if you like. Okay. Phil, what do you got? Critters. I got banded <laughs> woolly bears. And people get excited about trying to figure out what the winter is going to be like, and they look at various things. And one of them are woolly bear caterpillars. And uh, this is the one that you would, that you can theoretically use. It's the banded woolly bear. And the idea is that if the, uh, if the front of the, if the front black area is very long, then it's supposed to be an early, long, early, early winter. If the red band is, is wide, then it's supposed to be a mild winter. And if the back black band is, is wide, then it's supposed to be a, a late winter. And uh, the interesting thing about it is there are various woolly bears and you can, there are other species that are all black. And so people see those and they think they're gonna have a terrible winter because winter. it's all black. <laughs> and then there, and, that, and there's also the uh, yellow woolly bear and it has ones that are all red and ones that are all white and ones that are all yellow. It's a very variable species. And they see that and they go, well, we're not gonna have any winter at all. But it's a banded woolly bear that's, that does, does the supposedly prediction. And as you can see, these two are pretty much the same mm -hmm. as far as the amount of black and, and red, which means they're about the same age. Because as the woolly bear ages, the red area gets wider. And so if you get a young woolly bear, it'll have a lot of black on, looks like you're gonna have a very bad spring and a very, and, and, and a very bad fall. 
and just very little, uh, you know, of, of a good winter in between. Or if you get an older one, like these are getting, getting older, they're going to have a big wide band in the center, and you're going to be real good about winter. So I guess the answer is, can these predict a winter? You tell me, since they change what they're doing as the winter goes by. <laughs> Those or little liars. The, they're not lying. lying. It's just the way people look at it. <laughs> so we The bugs are right. <laughs> the people are wrong. That's all it is to He it. would oh, you'd say take that. the bug side. Yeah, I would. Always Absolutely. Always take the bug side. <laughs> well, what you, you, should, me? you should tell them is that these caterpillars overwinter just like that. That's right. That's they right. do not make a chrysalis like mm -hmm. another uh, mm -hmm. caterpillar you're going to show us. So when you when you get in and uh, and find these things in, in underneath a board in your garage during the winter time, and you think, boy, I better warm these up or they're going to be, nah, leave nah, them there. That's nah. what they want to do. They kind of hang out. And they're out. not not dead. No, nope, they're not dead. Come nope. back Just alive. taking a long. In fact, nap. you pick one up, put it in your hand, they'll start moving around. Yeah, they will. Yeah, at twenty below zero. As long as your hands warm. Oh, warm yes. Did you find those guys uh, just hanging out around the house? On my front porch. Oh, perfect timing I, for the I show. They wanted to be on TV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. They are. Right, Phil, can we be on the can show? Can we go with you can tonight? They're so cute, can too. We go? <laughs> All right. So we talk a lot on the show about doing soil tests. I know I do. Yes. That's, that's her <laughs> jam. That's Marty's jam. Yeah. So today, she's going to show you how to do it. So yep. take it away, lady. Okay. Now, can anybody do this? Anybody okay. can do this. It's so simple. I just bought this this evening because I couldn't find mine. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. So here you go. Um, you can get ones like this. You can get ones that are just like a, an electronic probe, and you got to put a little battery in them, and you stick it in the soil, and it'll tell you. But where's the fun in that? Right. Come on. Gotta put get on your, your mad dirty. scientist goggles. I know it's really fun. So. These come with little tubes, and they have little capsules in them. There's one for the, just the pH. There's one for phosphorus and nitrogen and potash, okay? I don't know if you can see those very well, but they're, they're color-coded. Mm -hmm. They have little capsules inside them with powder in them, okay? So I was just doing this while Ella and Phil were doing their show-and-tells. So I put the soil in. These are striated. I put soil into the first line, and then I... Emptied the Mad Scientist capsule in there, mm -hmm. and then I filled it with water up to the last line, and then you shake it up, and you let the magic happen. The magic. So here we go. Oh, we already know. pH charts, yes. Eight is alkaline, seven is ideal. Neutral, <laughs> six is acid, five is very acidic. And we have, dun, 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 dun. So you're looking good, right? Yeah, yeah, it looks like about seven and uh -huh. a half, probably. Not as alkaline as it could be, but also you need to know that I, that I got this soil right from the foundation of my home where there's concrete block mm -hmm. that's been mortared together and that leaches into the soil. So I know a lot, lots of times people want to plant shade lovers in their, on, their, on their foundation of their home because they, they, they'll tolerate it mm -hmm. because it's generally shady there typically. Um, but the problem is usually it's a little bit alkaline there as you can mm -hmm. see Very so cool. try to think about you know if you have a concrete base to your house which you know like 99.999 people do <laughs> you might want to amend that a little bit you know do some do some iron or do some aluminum sulfate or something test your soil mm -hmm. when we have folks call see what in and need. talk about certain things not blooming yeah. or certain things not thriving yeah. in certain areas right this is literally something you can do without having to call in the experts. You know? And it's fun. It's so easy. I, I mean, agree. I did I did this while they were doing their show and tells. About a bit. It's just ta da. Now there you know. go. Yeah, and you can you can test. This is just a pH test, but you can also test specifically, like I said, for nitrogen, potash, and uh, what's phosphorus. the other one? And phosphorus. Thank you. I was like, what? what? Okay. Yeah. The student and I have, becomes the teacher. Yes, that's you. <laughs> it so yeah and so and these each tube comes with two capsules i'm gonna stick this other mm -hmm. one in here because this one's wet so you can and i brought some other soil and if you're very good boys and girls i'll prepare this one and we'll look at it later okay let's okay. behave all right so i noticed that i never ever share anything and i kind of like to play in the garden too so i just took some pictures of myself <laughs> and my son over the weekend and i thought i would just uh, throw these out there so this is my four-year-old Deacon, and we went into the garden last week and dug up some Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes, as the, a lot of people call them. 
And these were actually tiny little cuttings I got, gosh, in the early spring from uh, John Bodensteiner, who's a regular here on the show. Mm -hmm. And I have gobs and gobs. And now, I was warned ahead of time mm -hmm. that these babies, like, go so crazy. Oh, that's my St. Bernard moonshine. I had two very <laughs> lovely helpers and one very moody preteen who was not in the mood to garden that day. But anyway, <laughs> so, I mean, wow. I Like I said, he gave me some very small cuttings. And from just that, that little section alone, there were probably 30 chokes oh, yeah. right there. So good thing I planted them next to the woods because I have a feeling that they're about to go bananas next year because <laughs> they loved where they were at. So anywho, I'll bring in things uh, as I can and... Uh, share some photos and pictures and stuff from my garden. So uh, we do have some callers on the line. So awesome. We're going to go to those. Uh, line two, we've got someone in Champaign with a question about uh, container gardening. Are you there? Yes. Hi, go ahead. Yes, we are preparing for next year for container gardening and just wanted to know if you can give us a few simple tech um, suggestions on what we should do. On how to just sort of get into it and get it yeah. off the ground? Okay. Yeah. Any of you guys into container gardening? Or are you sure. Yeah. Um, I, was gonna I, say. I think the most important thing is choosing a proper container. Mm -hmm. You need one that has a large enough soil volume, but it you you don't need more than about 10 or 12 inches, don't you think? Yeah, it doesn't need to be and, deep. And it has to have drainage. Unless you're growing potatoes. Yeah, <laughs> drainage. And um, uh, your soil is really there for support when you're container gardening, you're going to have to add fertilizer mm -hmm. during the growing season to keep them healthy and, and doing well. So a container with drainage, a large enough soil volume, a quality potting soil, and fertilizer. And then uh, Marty can tell us more maybe about some plants that you want to grow. Yeah. Do you want to do vegetable gardening? Yes. Okay. okay. Well, then pretty much anything you got. Mm -hmm. um, Corn is a little difficult in containers because it's so tall. Um, tomatoes, but are pretty a good much start. anything else: tomatoes, peppers. Mm -hmm. You can do onions. You can do uh, green beans. And if you're doing container gardening, if it's like a raised bed on the ground, that's different than a raised bed, you know, like waist high. Mm -hmm. So um, I always do uh, whole beans because I'm lazy. And I don't like to crawl around and pick them. <laughs> so, but if you're doing like higher raised beds, like waist high, well, by all means, do bush beans, and you can just mm -hmm. walk along and pick them. Um, you can also do strawberries in a raised oh, bed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you could uh, the, just about any any vegetable you want to do. Or herbs. Yeah. I think herbs and are herbs. good in containers. Mixed yeah. Containers even. Oh yeah, and they're and they're attractive too. A lot of them have variegation and they have blooms. A lot of people don't think about how herbs bloom, but they're mm -hmm. lovely. Mm -hmm. Really, really pretty. Phil, anything to say about pest control or pest management in beds or in containers? Is there any difference there on how to go about it or different things you see or won't see? Any advantages, disadvantages? Actually, there's an advantage occasionally if you don't have too large a container and too large of a, of a plant. You can actually uh, uh, put newspaper on the soil, put your hand against the soil, and you can actually invert the, the, the plant into a bucket of insecticidal soap mm -hmm. or whatever insecticide so you really don't have to spray and you get and you get coverage completely over the, the mm -hmm. whole area because you're dunking it mm -hmm. and so uh, as long as the container's not too big or you got real big muscles uh, you can <laughs> you can do that okay. uh, so that's that's one factor other than that it's it's all pretty much the same and if you do get something that's a real problem in the soil, an ant colony or something like that, whereas in a regular garden you have to have to kind of give up on that plant because mm -hmm. it's probably going to get its soil loose and it's going to dry out and it's going to die. You can repot the plant and put new soil in it without the ants. So, you know, there are options that you've got that you don't have otherwise. <laughs> Good okay. point. We're going to go Good. to line three. We've got oh. Joanna in Springfield with a question about mums. Go ahead. Hi. I bought mums earlier in the year and planted them in the yard and they're doing great and I know how to overwinter those, but I also bought some that are just in pots on the porch. Um, can I cut those off and bring them into the basement to store them or into our garages unheated and unattached? Can I do it in there? Um, I'd really like to try and save them so that I can put them in the ground in the spring. Uh, I'd say the garage. I don't think they would do well at, at 65 or something in a basement, yeah. but in a garage, and you will have to water them once a month. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you could possibly get them in the ground this fall, I'd almost recommend that. And then uh, straw them mm -hmm. or mulch, mulch them pretty heavily. 
Uh, yeah, some people yeah. sometimes will put them the pots right up against the north side of their house yeah. and put some leaves or straw around them and mm -hmm. overwinter them that way too. Okay, all right, we're going to Venus indicator with a question about soil. Venus, go ahead. I call and my question is, I have a beautiful pink roses that I uprooted, well, I dug it and it's from the different area indicator, and I planted it in my yard, and it bloom. It blooms red instead of the pale color. Does it mean my my soil is acidic? So were they a brighter color before? They were very light. They're light pink. Oh, okay. I and couldn't understand that part. Thoughts? Is this the first season you've had this 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 rose it's a in rose. the fall? Yeah. Is it is it the first season you've ever had it in the autumn? No. Okay, so it used to bloom pink in the autumn as well. Uh, it bloomed uh, on the other area when I when I dug it, it was pale pink, and then when I planted it in my yard, it's a uh, red. <laughs> Oftentimes, white or light pink plants will bloom a darker shade in the fall, and that's not uncommon. But it shouldn't be completely red it shouldn't be like that um i wonder maybe if it was a grafted rose and you got some sprouts from below the graft and you're getting a different plant altogether maybe do the flowers look the same hey my my soil is acidic is that why no no, no. the soil the soil will not affect the color of a rose okay. it'll affect the color of a hydrangea but not a rose oh. but i don't i just wonder if you got a sprout on that rose from below the graft, if it was a grafted rose. Do you know what kind of rose it is? Oh, uh, what do you call it? The one that is popular? Knockout. knockout. <laughs> uh -huh. A knockout? knockout? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm out of Trump here, Ella. Bill. Well, um, <laughs> the, the only thing about your rose is the, the different knockouts all came from the original one. Mm -hmm. So they made a double knockout. They made a a blushing do knockout. They made rainbow, pink, uh, yellow. Well, sometimes those yeah. different. And, and they could have. Ah. It might have reverted back. I Are don't we talking know. like DNA, like recessive genes yeah. that just say, "Hello, I'm here. Red hair, freckles. Hi." Put on your goggles. Wow. Because we're doing I, more mad scientists. I, wow. I would say <laughs> just, See, that's the stuff I find just fascinating. Just enjoy it yeah. because next year it may go back mm -hmm. i mean yeah i'd be knows? interested to see what it does in yeah, the spring right so, okay. and and if it's not the color that you like then you'll have to dig it up and replace Get it and one. you can find them just about anywhere okay I'd have, to, oh, sorry, I'd have to sorry. wonder if it might do both next year ah. could you call back yes in please call seven back months at exactly this time <laughs> and let us know all right does. betty in paris with a question about orchid care go ahead betty betty are you there Yes, I am. Hi, go ahead. Hi. What's your question? Uh, I have uh, I had this orchid for about three or four years, and it has bloomed really good, but it's getting so many roots, and the roots are going every which way, and it's almost getting too big for the pot, and I wondered if I could uh, tra put it into a bigger pot. Would it hurt it? No. I kill every orchid I have, so I'm going to listen very closely to them. Yeah. Those yeah. are finicky little pests. They, they are. I don't, <laughs> have, I don't have a good area for orchids. I do love them, but, you know, you, uh, you can repot them. They like yes. tight shoes, right? Is that true? All, all potted plants need tight shoes. Okay. All okay. potted plants. But orchids are going to grow out of the pot anyway. They do that because they're, they're looking for air. They're epiphytes. They, they need air more than water. So if it's just if it's just sending roots out around the pot, that's no biggie. But if it's just inundating the pot and it looks like it's going to crush it and eat it like candy, then you're probably going to have to repot it. Yeah. Okay. The important thing is is whatever you repot it into, look to see what it's what it's in right now and make sure it's a very light, airy mixture like that. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. need to make sure that that what it's been doing so well in, you keep it in that type of thing. So you can make it a bigger pot. But just make sure that it's the same type of soil mix or, or potting mix yeah. that you've got it in there because otherwise uh, uh, it's likely to, uh, to die on you if it, as, 
as Marty said, if it doesn't get enough air, uh, orchids are not happy. Okay. Yeah. We're going to line five now. We've got Teresa with a question about mulch use. Teresa, are you there? I am. Hi, go ahead. Um, my question is, if I was using preen, should I use it before or after a mulch? Preen before or after mulching? It's after mulching. Yeah. That's what I thought. Bingo. Yeah. That was easy. Okay, yeah. thanks for calling. And if we, you use mulch, you may not need to preen. That's true. Because the mulch well, is going to help. Dandelion seeds will blow yeah. in. Yeah, the, okay. the seeds do blow in and then they, yeah. they okay. take in the mulch, so yeah. Okay, we're going to Ison in Champaign with a question about fall spring bulbs. Go ahead, Ison. Yes, I'd like to know, when will be the absolute last <laughs> month that I can plant my bulbs that are going to flower in the spring? Drop dead date. What do you say? When the ground's okay. frozen too hard yeah. to shovel. That's right. <laughs> okay. So you if could it's... go all the way to, you know, the end of December, possibly. Yeah. I have planted bulbs in December before. Wow, that's dedication. It's just if the soil, well, you have them and you don't get to them, you know. Yeah. The, yeah. So, yeah, but as long as you can dig the soil, you can, you can plant bulbs. They're going to need that cold period. Right. Just get them deep enough and... But but as soon as you do buy them, try to plant them. Yeah, it's better if you do it sooner than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be a little chilly out but, there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I was about 12 years old, we actually found some tulip bulbs on sale in the latter part of January. And I actually went out there and wedged the soil open, knocked out the frozen soil, came out in big clocks, put the tulips in it, put as many clogs clods of soil back on it as possible. <laughs> you could actually look down and see the bulb in between. Yeah. They bloomed that spring. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, nice. it isn't ever too late, really hardly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. The first right. couple oh, inches are going to be frozen. You guys off. I'm sorry, but no, it's not. I'm just, I'm ready. The first few inches. Well, let's get <laughs> you know, the question. <laughs> unless it's not January or February. You know, I mean, even in December, it's not going to be frozen hard in this area yet. So even if there's a little frozen crust of an inch or two, the soil still thawed underneath. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just do like Phil did. Get those big frozen You're good. Clods. Pour a bucket or on or water. Hello. All right, James on line four. Thank you for waiting patiently. Go ahead with your question. James, did we lose you? Yes, I am. Oh, hello. Oh, Go ahead. Is. I'm sorry. Nope, that's yeah, all right. Go I ahead with your question. The best way to care for a man develop through the winter. Bring it in. Yeah, that's, that's, one, that's the one that you will grow as a house plant. Yeah, oh yeah. He said yeah. it's already inside. He just wanted to double check with the experts. So oh, yeah. good job, James. Okay. Yeah, it'll probably drop some leaves and you can cut it back to make it not so, wah, you know, but after that, yeah. Give it light, give it water, stay yeah. out of the way. Yeah, plenty of, plenty of plenty of sun. Much sun as you can give it, really. So. All the sun you can give it. Okay, yeah. we've got three minutes left. Ella, we're going to go to you with no a way. question. Oh, I know, we're having so okay. much fun. I know. Sure. Uh, um, Trish wants to know what happened to our two four-year-old red leaf maples. They're concerned that they may not survive the winter. The process started about two weeks after the most recent crop dusting, which this is obviously dated a bit. Um, so they want to know what's going on with their tree. Okay, well, uh, Trish, you sent the pictures in, and I also brought maple leaves uh, from some maples at our work. And it's probably coincidental about the uh, browning of the leaves. That happened um, because of environmental conditions. The wetness of this spring, uh, there is a, a fungal disease, anthracnose, that can cause this browning. Uh, one thing to remember about when they're spraying fields, uh, they're using a pesticide, but is it an insecticide, a herbicide, or a fungicide, and really only the uh, herbicide would be problematic, and if that would be the case, more plants would have been uh, damaged. If it's the middle of the summer, the trees probably made enough, um, stored enough nutrients to be able to leaf out again next spring, but that's what you'll have to do is just wait till next spring to see what happens, and that's when you can go ahead uh, this fall, water, fertilize, and um, see what happens. Okay. We've got about 90 seconds, Phil. Do you think you could get that one in? Oh, yeah. All right. Let's rock and roll. What you got? There were some questions in an earlier show about uh, Venus flytrap and how to grow those. And I must admit, what everybody said is what my experience has been. 
I've had several of them. I've killed every one. The longest <laughs> one lived was about six or eight months. Uh, but uh, there are other insectivorous plants that will work well, and this is probably the champion of them all. This is a purple pitcher plant mm -hmm. that is actually native to uh, Canada and, and, uh, and Michigan and some other areas. But you need to make sure you get purpurea purpurea. There is purpurea venusa, which is sold a lot, and it's a southern one. But here you can see it actually blooming, and it will grow very well for you. So how do you take care of it? It needs to be in acid situations. It actually floats in a bog that I have oh. in which I put just rainwater in for, so I have an acid water. Wow. Very cool. How you have a bog. But, yeah. <laughs> Did you have a bog? I have a bog. This, this a bog. is how it keeps the caterpillars well, you know, in line too, go, by the way. It's kind of the, kind of the future <laughs> tense, a bug. It's bog, bug, bog, bug, bug, bug. bug, bug. bug. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you guys so much for sharing and bringing all your Ooh, stuff. Yes. And thank you so much for tuning in. We're out of time. Find us on our socials, Facebook and Instagram, to keep up with all things Mid-American Gardener. And email us your questions at yourgarden at gmail.com, and we'll do our absolute best to get those answered for you. We'll see you next time, and have a great evening. Good night.